Any questions as I get set up here? Okay, so we'll go ahead and just hop right in in that case. So we're on we're on lecture six. Um, just a reminder, you can get the uh, well, that's not what it is. Um, you can get the slides and the worksheet from the from the website uh we'll see if we get to the worksheet today also apparently next monday's off so i guess it gives me time to prepare more um another thing i added a few links just uh that i've i've mentioned about uh, various lectures so a couple for lecture two, some for lecture five. Um, and we'll talk about a lot of prefetching today. And so we'll, these will make a little bit more sense. We'll probably look at them briefly as well. All right, great. Let me go ahead and get started. So, What we're going to be looking at are ways to reduce cash misses. This is the number one like thing that we are going to be looking for whenever we see performance degradation. We're going to start by looking at cash and seeing what's going on there, why we're getting cash misses. Uh, give me just one second to adjust this. Okay, so we're going to categorize all cash misses into three different types. And then we're gonna kind of look at each one of these types separately. So our first type is compulsory. Um, this means that the program has never requested this data before. So it's kind of unavoidable. We're gonna pretty much always gonna get a cash miss um in this in this case um conflict is when we have seen the data but then we evicted it using our replacement policy and then um we we want to access it again so it's it's uh it was in cash but now it is no longer in cash but we need it the third option or the third the third category is capacity misses. Um, this is when this is going to occur when the program is just actively using more data than the cache can hold. And these are these are going to be collectively referred to as the three C's. Um, Why is this? There we go. Okay, so we're going to go through this simple example and just uh, um, kind of see what types of misses we we get. All right. So we have a direct mapped cache with 16 blocks and block size of 16 bytes. Um, so it's a very Pretty small cache, obviously, not many blocks. Um, and we have an application which is going to which is going to repeat the following memory access sequence over and over and over and over again. Okay. So let's do the cache geometry calculations to figure out how many bits are going to be on each part. So index bits um, uh, 16 over one because the associativity is one since it's direct mapped offset is also going to be log two of 16 so both of these are going to be four and um we're always just going to assume that these are 32 32 bits you can also see since this is a 
um, eight uh, hex digits that it's it's a 32 bit. So how does this how do we dissect one of these addresses? Well, the first six hex digits in this case, it's pretty nice. It's all lining up uh, to to the hex hex boundaries. So the first six digits are going to be our tag. The next hex digits an off uh, the index, and then we have an offset. Okay. So that's our geometry. Let's look at uh, this in action. So we first access OX8 whatever. When we access it, we're going to add it into our cache. Okay, so now our cache contains uh, the data. We don't really care what the data is. There's, this is always just going to be blank, but I'll just ignore that. Um, and it's going to be, we're going to mark it as valid. And we're going to have, store this tag in here as as our um, uh, uh, the this top six x digits. Okay, so what kind of a miss is this? It wasn't in the cache. We had to pull it in compulsory, right? This is the first time we've seen it, so um, this is going to be a compulsory miss. Okay, so. Let's go on to this one. Is this going to be a miss or a hit? This is the first question to ask. Miss? Who votes miss? One. Who votes hit? Yeah, so it's a, it's a hit because this is the index. Um, it's index zero. It's the same index as this one. We go back to the, the geometry calculations. We always look at this second from the right hex digit, determine which index we're at. Um, I, sorry, I, I have not been looking at chat. Define what a cache miss is. Yeah, cache miss is just when you check in the cache for data and then it's not there. The, the block that you're looking for isn't there. And then, uh, yeah, OX is just saying that this is a hex, hex, uh, hexadecimal. So this one's a hit. We have zero in, uh, in the index. And then we also do the tag check. The tag is the same. It's 800,000, except for in hex. All right, so it's a hit on, on, this, on this set. So now we go on to this next one. So we access eight zero 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 one zero. Now this is the index, it's one. The tag is 800,000 hex. Um, so now we have in, in the index one, our, our tag is 800,000. Um, what kind of a miss is this? This is, this is clearly a miss. We had to, it wasn't in there yet. Compulsory again. Yeah. So this one, it's kind of the same deal as the second access. We look and see it's a one. We look in here. Check the tag, it's the same. So this is gonna be a hit. Okay, what about this one? Well, we're gonna do the exact same thing. We're gonna go index one, check the tag. The tag was different. So going back, it's 800,000. This is kind of a little bit small. Let's, um, let's zoom in. A little, little bit better. Oh, this is going to be terrible to scroll now. <laughs> Whatever. Anyway, so the tag was different, so we had to change it. We had to go to the, um, we had to replace our data and then uh, update with the new tag. 
So this is also going to be a compulsory miss because we haven't ever seen this address before. Um, and then we come down here, 800,000 or 800,000 with two extra zeros, 80 million hex. This is going to be a hit because uh, it's here at an index zero. Tag matches. This one is also likewise going to be a hit, just like the one up, uh, one up here. Now we go to this. Okay, so we're going to access uh, eight zero 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 one zero, and the problem is that well, we've seen this. We have to look at index one, and the tag is different. Okay, so the tag is now uh, three hundred thousand instead of eight hundred thousand. So this is not going to match, or this is not going to match. But we've seen it before. We've accessed it up here. So what kind of miss? This is going to be a conflict miss. Yeah. So that's not cool. Um, this one is going to be a hit, just like up here. And then this last one, again, is going to be a conflict miss um, because we evicted it. Okay. So as you can see, kind of, we're we're kind of going back and forth between eight hundred thousand and three hundred thousand here. Yeah. Question. So these are the sixteen. In our cache. The, yes, correct. These are the 16 blocks in our cache. And if we only have, and so then the index that corresponds to the block that we're looking for this particular tag, is that correct? Right. The index bit, bit tells you which block to look for that tag in. And if we only have one digit for the index bit, then we're only ever going to be able to use the zeros of the first. Uh, this is this is this is hex though, so one one zero through s, so that's going to be all fif all fifteen. Yeah, yeah. So the next the next one is going to be a little bit less. Well, we're going to have to expand it out to binary because it's not going to nicely fit on the hex boundaries. But yeah, that that's a great question. Um, do the tags determine if something is a compulsory miss? So. The tags determine whether or not the data we want is in the in the cache, and if the defining factor of a compul of a um, compulsory miss is that we just haven't ever requested that data before. Um, so, like here, right? This first access to three zero 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 one zero. Was compulsory, not a conflict. Even though there was something already in this cache line, it was a it was a compulsory miss because we hadn't requested this specific bit of memory yet. However, this one's going to be a conflict because we had requested it and then we evicted it. More questions. Why is the second one a hit? Why is the second one a hit? So this goes back to um, it, the the process for for looking in the cache. We first look at the index. In this case, the index is zero. It's the second to last hex digit, and then we have to check the tag. So the first six digits are our tag, and compare it against what's currently in that zeroth index of our cache. And if those both match, then we use this last hex digit, in this case, eight. That's going to be our offset. Uh, that's going to be our byte offset. OK. Does that explain it? Um, so does it mean that when we put the first um, memory into this cache, we put all 16 uh, bytes of it into it? Okay, so the question is, do we put all 16 bytes uh, into this block when we yeah. see, when we do this? Yes, we do. 
So, oh, so okay. um, yeah, we pull in the entire cache line we took or our cache block. Um, so all 16 bytes are going to be in here. Um, so, uh, one more question. You probably mentioned it before, but where um, does the tag come from? So the tag is coming from the first six digits of our memory address. Um, so that would be the memory address on our hard drive. When uh, the, the memory address is just in it, uh, in RAM. Let's just we'll, we'll make that simplifying assumption for now. We'll make it more complicated later when we talk about virtual memory. But for now, let's just assume this is an address in RAM. Well, she okay. should be in that consult. I'm going to mute somebody. There we go. Okay. Hey, Sumner. Yes. I just want to make sure I understand. So the reason that we got the conflict was because we had two different tags that had the same index bit, right? That was like right. the source of the conflict that caused so, us to eject the 3,000 tag. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, so the question was, the reason why we get these conflict misses is because we have a bunch of things, or in this case, two things, with the same index, that's correct. In a direct map cache, if you have multiple things that are mapped to the same index, that have the same index, and you keep alternating between accessing those two, you're definitely going to get conflict misses. Because you're just going to like keep shoving them in and out of the cache. Um, OK. So any more questions? Yeah, about that second one again. Uh, this second one or this one? The second or from the, um, it looks to me like we haven't called that one before. So why isn't it a compulsory this use? This one? Uh, it's 8000 and ends with 8. This one? Uh, no. Second from the top. Ah, uh, yeah. I, again, this is because the the of the cache line. Because the what? The the cache line pulled in all the indices from zero, like zero zero, all the way up to zero. F. I see. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Let's move on to another example, and hopefully, uh, as we do more examples, it'll it'll kind of help uh, solidify this and make it more clear. So now we're going to do another uh, do the same example, except we're going to increase our cache line size. So we're going to have a direct map cache still, this time with eight blocks, okay? And the block size is thirty-two bytes now and the same exact memory sequence. So we're gonna, we're gonna still stick with this. Okay, so when we do our cache geometry calculations, now we have our index bit. Uh, we have, that's the, the number of lines over one, which is our associativity, which gives us three. Uh, offset is log base 32, which is five. Log two base, or log two of 32, whatever. I think I miss, misspoke. And then the tag bits are what's left over, which is 24. So let's look and at an example. And this is maybe going to help clarify what we're, all, uh, what we're talking. Uh, is loading all 16 bits what gives us spatial locality? Uh, it, it, uh, loading in all 16 bits allows us to take advantage of spatial locality, is how I would describe it. Is it always correct to say that the offset does not factor in with cache hit or miss? Yes, that is correct. The offset never matters. The only things that matter are the tag and the index. Oh, and I guess like technically like the valid bit in the cache as well. That's pretty important. Okay, so this is an expansion of, of this hex address into all 32 bits. We have to do this because Unfortunately, our index and offset aren't lining up very nicely. Okay, but um, so here's our tag. 
this first one, this is where we get the eight, and then there's just a bunch of zeros. Um, and then this is our second to last hex digit here. And the first three bind, uh, the first three bits of it, so the three zeros are our index. And then our offset is going to include this, this one in the binary. Um, so 16, right? All right. So let's look and see this in action. So the first one, just like the last one, obviously compulsory, right? We've never seen this before. The next one we go along and this one as well is going to be a hit because um, we have we have seen this before or we, we pulled it in right here right so this one pulled in everything from um, from address From this address to O at eight um, one F. So all of these addresses have been pulled in by um, by our, our, our by pulling in this this cache line. Um, okay. And this eight falls in that range, so this is going to be a hit. This one also falls in that range, so it's going to be a hit. This one as well, hit, because that's that's within our, our range that we pulled in. And then we go to this. Okay, so our tag is going to be 300,000. Our index is what zero right because it's the first three digits of this hex digit here right if we expand this out it's you know three dot 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 and then zero zero one zero 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 and these are the three bits that we care about for index so it's index zero and that's unfortunate because the index zero is already occupied so we're going to have to replace it as we have up here. And this is going to be a compulsory mix. Because we've never, we've never seen this before. Um Okay, and then we access this address again. And this will be unfortunately a conflict miss because, well, we're back to this index zero and needing to put the tag 800,000 in. So we get a conflict miss, but then we get a bunch of hits just like we did up here. And then back to conflict. And we're just, you know, It'll just kind of repeat this over and over, kicking 300,000 out and then pulling in 800,000, kicking that out, pulling in 300,000. Okay, questions on this? I'd like more clarification. Hold on, Wyatt. Um, of the 32, in this example, 32 uh, bytes that we brought in as data, what, like what specifically in that, that 32 byte number? Correct. So uh, what Jason was saying is that what does the offset do? The offset tells us um, which byte in those 32 bytes that we pulled in we want to access. And it's one byte at a time that we're accessing. And we, yeah, it is byte addressable. So we can access each byte individually. But, you know, if you're trying to pull in, for example, a you know, if you're talking about instructions, for example, or whatever, then they would potentially have, they would have to be um, 
word align or stuff like that. But yes, if you're doing a specific byte access, then then you could access anything from uh, this address all the way up to here and be, be fine. And it'll be in this first uh, first row. Is that a separate parameter that specifies somewhere else how much data from the offset will use? Yeah, yeah. So it would be, you know, the, uh, the question is, how do you know how much from the offset point to pull in? Well, you, if it's a load half word, then it's going to be a half word. If it's load word, then it's going to be a full word, or load byte, then it's going to be that. Yeah, great questions. Um, any others? What exactly does the index bit do here again? So the index bit again tells us which. Oh, I should have made. Sorry, I should have made this cache smaller because there should only be up to seven. Um, I'll, I'll update that in the slides. It tells us which line of our cache, or which um which index in our cache to look um, for the data. Yes. No, so remember, uh, if we go uh, back up here, we have to split up that one. We have to, we have to remember that the first, the, the least significant bit of that is part of the offset, not part of the index. Yeah, it, it's kind of unfortunate, right? Like you do have to sometimes expand out. And I, I definitely recommend like, it's pretty tedious, but it will help you not mess it up. Just expand out the text into binary and then divvy it up. Um, because most of the time it's going to be something that's, you know, not aligned very nicely, like the first example. Okay, one more. Yeah. Sorry. So the, um, in the last lecture when we had a introduce the concept of associativity and specifically direct map. The example was like block 12. Uh, we had to do like 12 mod 8 to determine which block we were going to place mm -hmm. that memory into. Can you can, like connect the dots for me here? Because I, I guess in this case, I mean, like, we only specify three bits. We're never going to have to mod, right? I mean, how, how, how does the modding factor in? That's a great question. So. Um, let's look at this address. And if we just chop off the last five, because we never care about the offset like this. Now, what if you do a mod of eight on this number? Ignore, ignore the, you know, under braces here. If you mod this binary number by eight, um, it's going to be the last three digits. So before we were modding, like the entire number, not just the index. Right. Well, so mod of, you know, it, the, the idea is here, let me, let me cover. Let's see. No, mod of that, right? Mod of, if you convert, if you convert this entire thing up to the end of the index into decimal, it's going to be zero at the end, right? And then mod mod eight is going to be zero. Also, if this was a all ones, it would still be at the very end, some multiple of eight if you converted it to, to decimal. So if you do a mod by eight, then it'll, um, it'll be zero. But the terminology of like when we were saying clock 12 mod eight, that was like the entire binary sequence that is 12. Right. Yeah. No, that makes sense. I think then, like the term direct mapping, exactly. So dir direct map is saying this. Just go look at this index, and that's all you have to do. You don't have to go look at other stuff at that same set. Okay. So let's go, and maybe this isn't such a simple example, but uh, we'll we'll go to the next next iteration of it where we're going to introduce associativity. 
So, um, we're going to go with an eight block cache and a block size of 32 bytes. And we're going to have the exact same memory sequence. So, when we do our cache geometry calculations, now they're a little bit different. So, we have eight divided by two. And that's four log two is, is two. Offset bits are the same. It's five still. And then let's look at how this dissects. Like the last time, it's it's not clean on the offset uh, or on the hex hex um, boundaries. So I have to expand it out to binary. And we see that this is the, the offset, the last five bits. And the index is going to take two bits. Everything else is a tag, which makes it really annoying because our tag is also not anymore aligned with the hex digit. So be aware of that when we go to the next slides. They're going to look a little bit funny. Um, and the reason is just that like uh, we basically multiplied by two um, because we added another bit. So let's look at this example. First of all, let's look at our cache. And we notice that there's four sets, so 0, 1, 2, and 3. And everything else is the same, right? But whenever we look in index zero, we have to check in both of these positions for the tag that we're looking for. So first one around, we're going to go with uh, this. We're going to put it in here. And this is going to be a compulsory miss. So let me just expand this out because it is a little bit annoying to, to think about. This is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I think. Did I make enough zeros? Three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah. Okay. So, so this is our address. Um, so this right here is our offset. That's our tag. And this, all of this here is, oh, sorry, this is our index, apologies. And this here is our. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so if we pull, if we pull this guy down and re redo the, the groupings, right? Move that over, move this over, move this here, move that there. Um, oh, I think I, I might have messed up this one, but one, two, three, four, five, five zeros. Um, I'll double check this tag. I might have I might have screwed that up. Anyway. 
the point is the same. We're, we're, we're still hitting a compulsory miss here because we haven't ever seen it here. We're going to be fine. It's going to be a hit. This one's also going to be hit because it's in the cache. Hit. And this one is where things are a little different. So before, when we didn't have any associativity, this was a miss, or it was a conflict, or sorry, it was a compulsory miss, but we had to evict our original line. Okay. And I'll double check on these tags because it's annoying to have to deal with. So this is still a compulsory miss, but we didn't have to evict our our original line because we have associativity. We can put it into either place. I think the problem is your your Oh yeah, sorry. I'm retarded. Uh, right, so there you go. Yeah, I, I, the ASCII art was on point. The the conversion to let's just ignore that. And then the the three is going to be one one right here. Oh wait, this is going to be a zero. It's going to be a one. Therefore, this is zero. This is one. Which is this tag, and then the other one is going to look like. This, which is where we get the six. So yeah, I'll probably learn, you know, that eight is not what I did. That was seven. Okay. Um. Anyway, good catch. Uh, what is this one going to be then? What? When we access eight, eighty, whatever, it'll be a hit because it's here, right here, because we never had to evict it. So that's good. What about this? Also a hit also a hit, so a hit, also a hit, and it'll continue being hit over and over and over and over again. Yay, associativity. Yeah, question. Those are in hex. Yeah. Yeah, let me, I'll, I'll, I'll loop back to that in just a moment and answer a couple questions. Yeah, so why it's still in the cache, it's, um, it's right here. Why do, the, do they just fill into the cache block one after another? Eight and three. Um, no, I would, the, each one of these is a separate block. They're in the same set is the way that, that uh, I would describe this. Okay, so let's, I think that part of it is that I've confused you with the whole, you know, fact that this is, these indices are weird. So let's, let, let's go over those again, because I kind of screwed them up. Okay, so let's dissect, again, this guy here. When we expand it out, this is the ones place. Two's place, four's place, eight's place. Yay, so this is a one. Um, and then each one of these text digits corresponds to a, a, a four, four, four bits. A nibble. A nibble. A nibble. If you want to uh, sound cool. OK, and then when we dissect this, we take the first five bits as Um, 
our offset. The next two are our index. But then we, if then this is our tat. Okay, so this is a full, uh, what, 25, I think, bits? Is that what we said? 20. I don't think that's right, since that's a multiple of 2, 4, 8, 12, 16, 20, 24, 25. Okay, more flight updates. Okay, so 25. And 25 is not a multiple of 4. So when we rewrite this and kind of adjust everything um, so that then it is lined up into um, uh, you know hex digits here. Then we get a one at the very end, and then there's one, two, three, four, five, six zeros, which is exactly what we had in the tag over here. So one with these six zeros. And when we do the same thing with OX3 here, 3 is 0, 0, 1, 1. And then we, we have to shift everything over because of the, the additional 0 that we get from, from the second to last hex digit, then it turns into a 6. So a binary. Left shift by one is just times two. That's that's what's going on. All right. This entire um, hexadecimal uh, number is referred to as a block address. Is that right? What's what we call this? Whole so th what is this whole whole hexadecimal number? It, it it's the memory address. And that persists like no matter what we're in cache or in the actual memory. Right. Yeah, right, right. So this is think of this as an index in RAM. So then the 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 tag bit are really just the total number of unique memory effects that we could possibly have. No, I so the total number of unique memory addresses is just the entire space of zero, all zeros to all s, eight zeros to eight s, which is just all ones, all 32, 32 ones. So that's our memory address, address space. Um, the possibilities for each one of these blocks would be the number of bits in the tag two to the number of bits in the tag. Um, so obviously this cache kind of sucks, right? There's only eight places to put stuff and we have potentially, we're indexing, you know, two to the 32 different bytes, which is not, not so cool. Which is why caches are much bigger than four sets and eight blocks. Okay. Let's, uh, will you have to convert hex to binary on test problem? Uh, well, you might have to. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that that wouldn't be on a test. Especially since it's very likely not going to be like it's very likely going to be a fake home test. Okay, so let's let's talk about how to reduce each one of these types of misses. Because remember, this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to get rid of these uh, these cache misses, uh, and and we're going to look at each type of cache miss in turn. So compulsory misses. Um, let's look at a way to reduce compulsory misses. The first thing that we can do is we can increase the line size. So we can increase our, uh, by the way, when I talk about line or block, it's the same thing. So what does this mean? 
Well, it means that we're going to request larger chunks of memory at a time. And we can see this. Let's um, actually uh, where. Let's save that. I'll I'll post. I'll send that out. Um, let's do. I'll see this cache. Look at the handout, which doesn't have all the animations. Um, yeah. So so. What we noticed is that when we went from this example, which had um, 16 bytes uh, per block, up to 32 bytes per block, we got more hits. So we got hits on these two um, where before we had a miss before we got a hit. Okay. So it does in increasing the line size makes us request more stuff from the from memory. And if we have lo spatial locality, that's going to help us. If we don't have spatial locality, then we pulled in a bunch of data that we don't want. So if we own, if we pulled in the entire cache line and then only access one index and then never any of the other ones, we pulled in all of the other bits of memory uh, and then never used them, which is pretty wasteful of bandwidth. Um, so if you're reading bytes effectively at random, you know, a few bytes here, a couple bytes over there, word here, you know, whatever, uh, bringing in large cache lines is going to hurt performance. Like if you, for example, pulled in a cache line that's a kilobyte, well, and then you access like one byte, that's really, really wasteful. Um, and which is why you'd never see a cache line that's a kilobyte. However, if you have sequential accesses, so um, you kind of have this this sum going, and you're you're going just through an array from zero to uh, a million, and indexing into this data array, you're going to get really good spatial locality, and you're going to be able to to this increased cache line size is basically going to implicitly give you um like prefetching okay any questions Okay, so prefetching. This is um, another idea for how to reduce compulsory misses. If we can speculate, if we can guess what future instruction uh, and data accesses are going to do, we can pull the data that they need before they need it. Right? Um, in general, instruction accesses are going to be easier to predict than data accesses because most of the time, you're just going to the next instruction. The vast majority of the time, instruction accesses are going to be just, just you speculate that it's going to be the next block. You just need the next one. And there's a lot of different things, that, a lot of different varieties of, of prefetching. There's hardware prefetching. There's software prefetching. There's mixed schemes where we have some instruction that the processor gives us, and then we can invoke that from code, um, and we're going to look at each each one of these in turn. So we'll start with hardware prefetching. So consider this: we have some back to our for loop that's just summing everything in and uh, in in data. So in this case, the processor can identify the pattern that we're uh, act the access pattern, the memory access pattern. And proactively prefetch the data that we're asking uh, that the program will ask for. So, 
what is the pattern here? So if we access memory address A, what's our next memory address that we're going to access? Yeah. A plus one. How big is an int? You're, you're pretty close. Like it's A plus four. Um, it's important to remember the size of your data, data structures. In this case, the data structure is an int, so it's, it's four. Um, so this is the pattern. The next address is going to be the current address plus four. Um, now, there's a lot of different variants, even on hardware prefetch. So the first one is prefetch on miss. This is that if we, if we miss B on block B, then we prefetch B plus one. So we prefetch the next block. And that's, that's one option. We also have a one block look ahead scheme. So this is, this is different in that it, it, still, it still prefetches B plus one, but it does so anytime B is accessed, not just when we have a miss on B. Uh, so we access, let's just say, um, block one. We're going to also say, oh, hey, grab block two for us as well. And as you can kind of tell, that's probably advantageous for something like this, right? So if we grab one block, let's just say it has eight integers in it, and then we, we also simultaneously ask for the next block, which has the next set of uh, uh, next bit of data, that's going to be pretty convenient. And you can extend this to n block look ahead, where not only do you fetch b plus 1, you also fetch b plus 2 and b plus 3 um, and prefetch those as well. The, the next one is a strided prefetch. So this is, um, this is basically saying that if we observe some memory access pattern that goes along the lines of B, then B plus N, and then B plus 2N, so we're skipping every N uh, over to every N block, the prefetcher will fetch B plus three n. So it'll fetch the next one in that sequence. And at this point, I'm going to open up this because it's kind of an interesting article. Oh dear. I'll fix the link on the website. So this was a long time ago. 2014, um, but it's kind of like they haven't changed it a ton, I don't think. I don't think you can set this MSR bit unless you're the BIOS anymore. But basically what this thing is, is it's, uh, it's some description of the prefetchers that are available in the Intel processors. And um, so there's four different prefetchers. They're all enabled by default. You can disable them. You can actually do this in your BIOS. Um, I don't have any pictures of, of that because I don't have an Intel CPU in my desktop, but uh, we have one prefetcher, which is an L2 hardware prefetcher. This just um, fetches uh, additional lines of code or data into L2. Um, we have an L2 adjacent cache line prefetcher. So this is just this uh, kind of this one block look ahead scheme, more or less. It's a little bit different because basically the idea is that uh, it's, it's paired, uh, the, the memory is kind of segmented into um, two, into pairs of two cache lines, and then it pulls in the other 
cache line. So it could be the one before as well as the one after, depending on which one you access. And then we have a DCU prefetcher. And this is um, this is fetching the next cache line into L1 data cache. Um, so this is this is exactly this one block look ahead scheme. And then the DCU IP prefetcher, this is the it's similar to our strided approach. It uses a sequential load history based on the instruction pointer uh, of previous loads and determines whether or not to prefetch additional lines. I have no idea. Intel is like terrible at disclosing exactly what's going on. So I have. I don't think really anybody knows what's happening under the hood fully. Um, but the main the main goal of this article wasn't to like get you to be an expert in M the MSR register of the Intel processors from 2014. The point is to show you that these are actual strategies that do get used in real processes. I see. This so the question again is uh, so this is just it show it's you know, let's just say that you're jumping through an array at, at a at a at a cadence that is not, you know, just the next one, right? You're you're jumping over some some large number. Uh, that, that's that's where started prefetch would help. Yeah, if you're going every like 20 instead of or you know instead of every like just four or eight or 16 or something like this, or uh, it all depends on your cast line size, obviously. What would be the benefit of turning them off? Um, well, yeah, it if you're if you are using if you know exactly what your memory access pattern is, you might want to turn these off because one problem, and we'll talk about this in about, I don't know how many slides, but a couple of slides, is that we, if we pull in, if we prefetch too much, we're going to cause cache pollution, which is not good. Yeah, you can turn off hyperthreading as well, uh, which is probably not something you want to do either. But you could if you wanted to, I guess. And this is Firefox with Freestyle tab, which is the best uh, best browser extension to ever grace the face of humanity. So we have some problems though with prefetching. Um, so first of all, our prefetching has to be useful. What does this mean? It means that it has to actually produce hits. If it doesn't do that, then it's pretty useless, right? If it doesn't increase the hit rate, why did we do it? It also has to be timely. Um, so it can't be too late and it can't be too early. So what does this mean? Well, let's just say that we we prefetch block block A and then we like access it, but the prefetch hadn't finished. Well, that would be that our prefetch was too late. What would it be if it's too early? Well, let's just say we again prefetch block A. But then we did a bunch of other stuff and we had to evict it and then we accessed it later. Well, that was a waste. We, we prefetched it in, got rid of it, and then we have to get it again uh, on a miss. So that's, uh, those are two problems that we're going to have to deal with. And they're, you know, they're just very difficult. Um, and we're also going to have to be wary of cache and bandwidth pollution. This is what I was alluding to a minute ago. Um, so let's just say that we have uh, two caches, one for instructions, one for data. And we prefetch a ton of data. We prefetch all this blue data in here. Well, if we never use it, it's just sitting here wasting space in L1. So that's not cool. And we might have evicted something that we needed to make space for something that we didn't need. 
So this is this is like one of the main kind of trade-offs that we have to make. Um, and this is one reason maybe you want to disable one of your prefetches if you know exactly how your memory address or your memory access pattern will be. Questions? How do they create this prefetching effect? Talk to an electrical engineer. Um, I have no idea. So let's move on to reducing um, compulsory misses via software prefetching. So this is this is another prefetching strategy. Let's just say that we have uh, some code. We're doing a sum where we're, we're, we're like, we have two arrays that we're multiplying together and adding to the sum. We can attempt to make the hardware prefetch data for us. So let's just say that we, we have some function which just goes and accesses a and B at, at our current index plus some P, some offset P. Um, why do we want to do this? Well, eventually then we'll get down here and we'll actually use, use that stuff that we just prefetched. Um, so accesses, you know, if you're the programmer, you can predict very accurately what your memory access pattern will look like you know this is pretty obvious it's going to be the next index in your array every single time the problem is we're going to have a really hard time getting our timing right because this prefetch is going to take a lot of while it's going to take a few cycles at least probably many cycles and so you have to set p in such a way that your data is coming in right as you need it um if you prefetch you know if you have a very small p well your data is not going to be there by the time you get around to needing it so that's pretty useless um and if you prefetch too early you're going to end up causing pollution you're going to have data in there that you don't need and potentially even have to evict data that you do need um but you know you can estimate how long it'll take for the data to come into L1 and set P accordingly. That's totally possible, but it's like very hard to do for lots of different reasons. Um, I'll just name a few off the top of my head. We have no idea if the data is an L2 cache or not. So that's one issue. We also have no idea if there are other processes on the same core causing contention, unless we're like the OS or something, then we, we could probably know. Um, yeah, so this is just gonna be very hard. It's not, not, so, not so obvious how to approach that. So the next, next thing is hardware instruction prefetch. This is um, uh, let's see. Let me just do this. So this is where we prefetch instruction rather than than data. Um, so when we miss on the on an instruction load. Um, will load in the requested block i and also the next consecutive block i plus one. So this is just kind of trying to take advantage of the fact that uh, instructions are going to be executed generally fairly sequentially. So then we put the requested block i into our cache, our L1 instruction cache. And then we're going to put the next one into a, into a buffer. 
we'll call it the stream buffer, instruction stream buffer. And if we miss in the in the L1 instruction cache, but then we hit in the stream buffer, what we'll do is we'll move that data from the stream buffer into cache and prefetch I plus two. So this is this is kind of a way of uh, allowing us to um, not really pollute L1 instruction cache. You know, if we don't ever need what's in the stream buffer, we haven't really lost anything. But if we do, then it's right there, and it's going to be, you know, let's just say five instruction or five cycles instead of twenty to go out to L2. Um, Okay, so that's 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 it on prefetching for now. We'll get back to it later, but any questions on that? So let's talk about another way that we can reduce compulsory misses. Um, this is something that a programmer would have to do. And maybe if you have a really, really smart compiler or something, you could maybe get, a, get do this. But really, it's pretty much the programmer's job at this point. And that's uh, restructuring. So we can restructure our code in such a way that we can take advantage of the memory access pattern. So let's look at this snippet. We have a struct, which has a double, double, and then a double three. So this is just a, this is a point basically, an X, Y, Z coordinate. And there are three doubles. So how does this get laid out in memory? Uh, I guess I'll pull up them again. Um, oh, we also have an array of them. So we have, we have an array of all these things. And like what we're going to end up having is we're going to have our these. Let's just, I'm going to assume that our floats are four units, four characters wide. Um, and then our f value and then um, p. So this is just going to be kind of our layout in linear memory of this struct, of a single struct, right? And then we have a bunch more. You know, it just keeps going on and on. This is an array of, of size n. Now, what are we doing in these for loops? The first for loop does some stuff with a V. Okay, so let's go back over and look at our beautiful diagram. We're accessing this bit of memory, then we're accessing this bit of memory over here, then this bit of memory over here, this bit of memory over here. We might be able to take advantage of strided prefetch here, right? That, that would definitely help out. But that's not so that's not so cool, right? Because then eventually we're gonna go back and now access F in our second loop. And then access P in our in our third loop. Um, and we're kind of gonna be going through this this uh, um, this bit of memory multiple times. And probably it's you know, this N is, you know, this is a, a real application, so N is not going to fit in cash. So does anybody have an idea of how we could restructure this code such that we can take advantage of uh, the memory access pattern? Yes. Have a single for loop. Let's just say that we can't have a single for loop. So 
stride. I'm not really sure how striding would really improve it. I mean, you could definitely like, a we could rearrange the data to have spatial locality. Yeah. Thread it. <laughs> let's say it's, let, let's not go, let's not thread this. Okay, so, so this is an, an idea. Um, instead of a list of structs, an array of structs, let's make an array of each one of the, the parts of our struct individually. So we have a bunch of, we have all of our Vs in one part of uh, memory in, in continuous mem memory. We have all of our Fs in continuous memory. We have all of our Ps in continuous memory. And, you know, that'll, th then we have a bunch of Vs, a bunch, a bunch of Fs, and then a bunch of, you know, P, Ps dot, 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 yeah, ad infinitum. And the nice thing is now, when we iterate over the Vs, we're gonna have them right there. It'll be sequential data accesses. You know, most likely we're gonna be able to fit, let's say four of these or two, two or three, two, three, four of these into a single cast line. So we're gonna be able to take advantage of the locality uh, um, via our cast line size. Um, and we don't have to worry about this like strided prefetch or anything. Um, and then we come back and we just do this. And we aren't loading and unloading the same bits of data over and over and over again. All right. I think we'll stop here. Because um, the next stuff is conflict misses. And we'll talk about that next Wednesday. Have a great whatever holiday this is. And we'll do the worksheet, I guess, on next Wednesday. Bye, guys.